All right, hey everyone. So we've got John here. For many years since uh, John has uh, been retired, he's uh, been helping us out here at the store, uh, usually most Fridays and Saturdays. And you know, John has always liked fishing, has done uh, all, all types for different species in different locations. But John, for the last few years, you've really gotten into trout fishing, yeah. specifically uh, river fishing. Yeah, I've gotten steelhead fishing probably for the last, uh probably 40 years, if not more, but uh, it's really evolved over the last few years and we're seeing that more and more people are getting into it. And uh, uh, Mark talked to me and said, well, why don't we do a little seminar? Because we do have a lot of new people coming into the shop that just want to really start and are, are just trying to figure out where to start and some of the, just basically the basics on getting started in float fishing. So uh, uh, we thought we'd do this little bit of an update today. Sure. So, so why, John, why do you think uh, float fishing has become a little bit more popular over the last uh, number of years versus um, bottom bounce uh, type of fishing? Well, I think it was back to, probably back even in the 80s. I think float fishing started in the 80s. Um, and a lot of people probably brought it over from probably in Europe where there was a lot of float fishing. On the West Coast, there was probably a little bit more float, float fishing. But prior to that, most people bottom bounced. And it's a real art to be able to river, fish a river bottom bouncing and that uh, there's lots of rocks in the river. Now if you fish in a nice, nice pebbly, pebbly uh, stretch of water, it's fine, but there's always those big snags. And uh, the one thing that you're able to do with, with float fishing is uh, suspend your bait above those rocks and, and position it and, and fish it so that uh, it's a little easier to fish. Uh, Bottom bouncing is a real knack in that you really have to have the feel on what that bite is, and float fishing does simplify that uh, quite a bit. Uh, the early years, a lot of guys I remember first started were using like fly rods, and, uh, and 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 just a small float like a nine foot fly rod and float, and then it's evolved now over the last probably 20, 30 years where you know most people are using anywhere from 11 to 15 foot float rods with center pin reels. So it's, uh, and it's continued to evolve and, and, and more and more people are getting into it. Right, so. yeah. No, it's, and it's uh, I guess it's a way too that, uh, you know, there's people who want to get into fishing more and want to target the, the steelhead and, and, you know, browns and, and other fish to be caught float fishing. But, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of spots within Southern Ontario that, you know, you can get into. And once, it's, it's a little bit of a cost to get set up initially, but once you're set up, um, you're set for a while except for just replacing terminal tackle Pretty much. Uh, every so often as opposed to you know owning you know a boat and all the maintenance and everything that goes with that so and I guess the season's a, a nice length you know it, it yeah. can start you know in October some years and go right through uh, mid-May sometimes depending on the weather for the yeah. most part so and, and you can target different fish like in the you know the, in the early season as the salmon are coming in a lot of guys are float fishing for the salmon and then as the steelheads start following, you know, that's when more and more people are actually, you know, targeting that steelhead, uh, that steelhead run that comes in. And right now, as we're getting into early November, this is starting to be prime time in steelhead. And the water's getting cooler now. And, uh, you know, the steelhead are in feeding on whatever salmon eggs that are left in the river. And now we've been fishing on bugs and, and streamers and stuff. And uh, you know, between now and the end of December is when the real hardcore steelheaders really go at it, so. Okay, well, let's talk about, uh getting set up so uh let, let's start what what let's go through what you need to uh, to get started uh float okay. fishing for for a newcomer well like in any sport you can you can go as you can spend a little bit of money or you can spend a lot of money and i think what we generally try to get the people to come into our shop is just and for the most part they're they're newcomers to, to the sport is set them up with a rod and reel that you know that's that's not too expensive uh there's a number of reels out there now uh for example uh you know, Raven makes this Helix, Helix reel now. This is a, like a five inch Helix. You can get that reel for about $200. And you can set that up with a, um, a fish, a rod, like a, a, a 13 foot float rod, like $130 to $180. And then we do have the Ravens with the reel seats on them that are about $300. So, you know, when you really think about it, you can get into the sport for probably by the time you get the terminal tackle and everything set up under five hundred dollars now besides that you definitely would need to get a pair of decent waders because you're fishing at this time of the year the water's cold 
and you want to have some decent waders so you can walk and not get wet. So, but once you have that set up, that's a nice basis to start. And then from there you can, the sky's the limit. You know, you can go out and buy, you know, float rails up to $1,500, maybe even more. Uh, get a custom built float rod for over a thousand dollars. So there's guys that are really into it and have that kind of money into it. But to enjoy the sport, you know, you can you can start off with with a, a, an investment of about five hundred dollars. Okay. All right. Now let's uh, let's talk about the the setup. So. Okay. So so we start off with with a reel. I'm just basically here. Uh, I've got a setup here. Let me get it back in here. So for the most part, you got to, you know, a, most people start to get a center pin reel. And then the key is what you really want to first establish is where do you want to put the reel. So for first time float fishers, what we generally do is we, we set them up with a reel that's got the sliding rings so they can put the reel from, you know, up high if they like or down low. And once they get to the point where they really know where they want that reel set, they can, you know, use them like fishing tape and so forth. And, and, and put that on. And after they, you know, fish for a number of years and they want something that's permanent, they can get a custom rod built and put that reel seat wherever you want it. Okay, so that's the first thing. Uh, as far as the rod, um, you can buy a float rod from, let's say, 11 foot up to 15 feet. For the majority of the rivers in our area, you know, a lot of people would be fishing Bronte, maybe the Ganaraska, get up north and fish uh, the Big Head or the Saugeen. Or the Maitland, you know, a 13-foot rod is, is a pretty good all-purpose rod. You know, a lot of people first getting into it will say, "Boy, that's that's quite a long rod. I don't know if I need one that long." But the key to float fishing is that you want to make sure that your line is not touching the water when you're fishing. So you want to have direct contact from the top of your rod tip to where your float is in the water, so that you have control and you can see your bites and so forth. So that's 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 a good thing basically look at. So if you're fishing a small river like the Brawny, you can get away with 11 foot rod. But if you're getting into some of the larger rivers where you're going to be fishing pools that are a little bit further out, you want to get to uh, at least a 13 foot rod. Okay, so well, obviously the, the float reel is the ideal way to go. Um, can you use a, a spinning reel to, to float fish uh, a river? Oh absolutely. And a lot of guys you know, start by using the spinning reel. Uh, the one thing that the spinning reel does do for you, if you're fishing a larger river, you can cast the spinning reel a little bit further if you want to get out into the farther pools. Um, you know, it's, it's harder to let the line out, but, you know, a lot of people do that. But just for cost sake initially, and if you're not sure if you're really going to like it, you can start off with a, a spinning reel. But for the most part, you're going to be fishing runs and so forth that are going to be a, a little bit closer to you. The float reel allows you to throw the line out, your float out, and then as that float moves down the river, the float reel spins and automatically lets the line out. So what you do is you control the spin of the reel with, with one of your fingers to try to slow that drift down a little bit so you can make the, the perfect presentation to the fish. Okay. Now I've also seen that some are using a, a bait casting reel as well as an alternative. And a lot of people do, and that's very popular as you get out into Western Canada and in the Western U.S. Uh, they're using substantially larger setups, bigger floats, heavier rigs. Mm -hmm. So it's and also those reels all have a drag on it. So mm -hmm. when you're seeing a float reel like the ones that we're using here, your drag is basically your hand. You learn how to palm that reel when you get a fish on, um, and you'll get. You know, the, the first time you do get a big fish on, you probably get your knuckles busted a little bit or you could lose a fish, but there's quite a bit of force and those things really spin once you get a fish on. So it takes a little bit getting used to, to palm that reel and, and, and basically put the drag onto it. But after a while, you get used to it. So Okay, so let's, uh, we've, got, we've got the rod and the reel. What kind of line? Okay, so your, your, the line that's for your, your main line um, we're recommending that you probably want to use like a 8 or 10 pound or 10 pound um, monofilament line. I like using something that's got color on it because I can't see all that well anymore, but it allows you to see where your line is going to your float. So that's just your main line. From there, you would put a length of, so if you're fishing a 10 pound uh, mono main line, I would put on an 8 pound line in between the main line 
to where I'm going to attach my tippet. And that length, that's a, I use an eight pound floral, uh, about six feet long. So that goes from my main line. And then from there, I would attach and put what I call my tippet or my leader, my leader length. And that's generally, uh, I'll use, it'll be a lighter test than what the other two lines are. So for the most part, in, you know, this time of year, we'll probably be using anywhere, you know, maybe a six pound line. In the spring, when the water even gets, gets clear, we might be going down to four pound test. But remember, we're using quite a long rod. So those rods can really absorb the shock of the fish. So you can fish lighter lines and of course use smaller hooks. That leader length that you put from your, your, your second line is generally anywhere from two feet to three feet long. And then you put your, your, your bait on the end of that. Okay, and then you have a, um, a series of split shots in, in yeah. your float. Let's talk about that setup. Okay, so, uh, and we'll probably, you know, we'll probably have another a little um, a video a little bit further on as far as how to properly set your shot based on the different waters. But if you, I don't know if we can see here, but you can go up through the camera. Yeah. So if we look here, I've got this, this float set up here. So what you've got is, so let's say we here we got, okay. So you got your float, needs the rest of you. your float so then you get some shot rate under that so the float would generally be a little higher put your shot and then you have a, a number of shot running through to your swivel and then from your swivel there's about you know 30 inches to your your bait and your hook so that's what your general basic set, setup would be and why as you get into it if you're not used to it, just come into the shop and we can help you get that initial setup uh, done for you okay but it's just a matter of placing those those shot between your float and your swivel and you'd stagger them based on what the water conditions are. So if it's faster water, you put a little more weight on and stagger them closer to your swivel at the bottom. If it's a very slow moving pool, you could probably just position those shot in an equal distance amount down your line. Okay. The reason you do put a little bit more shot towards the bottom if it's faster water because you want to get that line down as quick as you can to where the fish are. I see we have a number of different floats here. Uh, why don't you explain uh, what they are, like the different sizes and materials okay. and what situation is uh, better for one or the other. So floats will range anywhere from a, uh, uh, let's say like a, you know, a small four gram float up to you know 11 grams. And if you're fishing heavier, faster water, you'd be using a bigger float. If you're fishing small water, very clear, you use a small float. So basically match the float to the, to the current and the clarity of the water. Um, if you're fishing very clear water and you put a big float like this, the fish are gonna see it and they'll shy away from it. So if you're gonna fish light, you know, that, that clear water, use a small float, small bait, and you'll be a lot more effective at catching fish. I also um, like running these, um, these Drennan loafers they're very, very slim profile, but they hold a lot of weight. Um, a lot of people will use a slip float. We'll get into more of that in the next video. Uh, if you're fishing deeper water, uh, like for example, if you're fishing the Niagara River, like this is just like a, a five gram float. The Niagara River, you'd be you know, fishing 20 gram floats using big baits to get your, your line down to a certain depth. So, so you basically, with your, uh, with your float set up, faster the water, the deeper the water, the more weight you got to put on, you use a bigger float. Okay. okay. Uh, let's move on to uh, your hook selection and then uh, the baits that you would use. Okay, so as far as hooks, um, you know, Raven makes a number of good hooks. Uh, Gam you know, Gammies make a bunch of good hooks. Owner makes good hooks. But for the most part, a lot of people will be using octopus style hooks. Um, and anywhere from size 6 to 12. Again, if you're fishing like um, spawn bags and so forth, you probably want to use a 6. If you're fishing like 8 millimeter beads, 6 millimeter beads, you could probably use a, a size 8 or a size 10. Uh, but again, you don't need to use a large hook. And then that a lot of people will come in and, you know, they're trying to put a size 4 hook or a size 2 hook. Again, these fish are very programmed. They've seen a lot of baits coming down the river. 
So try to keep your, 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 your terminal tackle as small as possible. When I'm fishing um, like size 8 beads, uh, I'll use like a small size 12 hook on it. And uh, you'd be surprised how strong those hooks are and how easy, you know, they, they hook in good and they hold pretty tight too. So again, it's personal preference to style a hook, but um, the octopus hooks or the sedge hooks are, are, are very good at, for doing what we're trying to do. Okay. Um, baits. So as far as baits, back in the early days, most people would fish with uh, row bags. Okay, so you'd buy, you know, basically some netting or an old scarf or whatever, and some people put floaters in them, and then you can tie it up with, with, with this thread. So row is still very popular. A lot of people use row, especially in the slower moving water and as you get into the cold temperatures. Um, remember, when those fish are spawning, when the salmon are spawning, trout are seeing those those salmon eggs coming down so if you present a, a spawn bag that is the same color as, as what they're used to seeing they're going to hit it over the last number of years a lot of people have evolved and, and also moved to you know baits like uh, yarn flies basically small pieces of yarn tied onto a hook and they're very effective as well and then recently a lot of people have gotten into fishing beads you've got hard beads in the natural colors, you know, basically uh, um, stimulate or basically you know, what, what a salmon egg would look like. And you can get them sizes uh, 12, 10, 8, 6. So as the water gets clear, again, I, I usually go to a smaller, uh, a smaller bait. But again, you're trying to mimic what the, sam what the fish are feeding on. So if there's a specific color of, of egg, you know, look at the, uh, if you see an egg that's been in the river for a couple days, you know, it gets washed out, so you go to a washed out color. Fresh eggs, you'd be using something a little bit more like this peach color. So again, you're, you're matching the hatch when it comes to, uh, to uh, the bait. Now, all, over the last, uh, last couple of years, people are also starting to fish some of these plastic soft baits, and you can just put those on your hook. So just there's so many new things out there that you can use, and they're all very effective. Uh, another thing that a lot of people will use is the the little three inch pink worm. You know, just fish it wacky style on a small trout hook and they're deadly. You know, for either spring steelhead or for fall steelhead. I remember the first time I fished one of these, I had a friend of mine and he'd been using it. He said, here John, why don't you try this? And gave me the rod. I took one cast and hit the first cast. So I guess that's what happens sometimes. So yeah, very effective pink, pink worms. And then as you get in later into the season now, um, a nymphs, start working really well and also streamers so like woolly buggers stoneflies um, as the water gets colder are very effective you know fishing them under your float as well so not just having to fly fish them you can fish them under your float and if you put a streamer on you can actually drift it and then also swing that fling us uh, easy for me to say swing that fly at the end of the drift and a lot of times you'll be picking those fish up at the very end and they hit it hard when they hit those streamers and here, this is just some of the, the small uh, nymph patterns we use, either like little uh, hare's ears, uh, little caddis nymphs. Uh, Stoneflies are very effective. I didn't bring any of the woolly buggers, but if you got like woolly buggers or egg sucking leeches, um, they're all very effective in, in, in catching fish. Yeah. Excellent. Is there anything that we missed? I think we've covered uh, quite, quite a bit for, uh, for someone who's uh, interested in getting started. Yeah, so it's, it's, you know what, a lot of people, it, it's not as complicated as, as it looks to start. You know, the key thing is you know, just get the basic setup, go to the river, and probably more importantly, is once you get the setup, is learning how to read the water and trying to figure out where the fish are. And we can get into some of those discussions in a, in a, in a, in a future presentation. So. Okay. Well, but any questions, um, I'm generally here on Fridays and Saturdays. Um, you know, or give Mark a call or send an email and uh, we'll be glad to get back to you and help you out. And uh, if there's anything we can help you with, you know, just, just ask us. Very good. Thanks, John. Okay. Thanks, Mark.